Jesus then went by boat, and where he landed there was a man who lived in a deserted tomb because he was tormented by an intrusion from the kingdom of dark spirits. Attempts had been made to confine him in fetters, but because of the strength unnaturally given, he easily escaped. Day and night he would shriek among the tombs and upon the hillside, terrifying people, and often injuring himself by falling. Jesus knew the nature of the tormenting thing and called upon the power within him, so it entered the body of the possessed man, wrestling with the evil thing inside him. Then the man ran screaming among a herd of swine, and two fell into a ravine. But shortly the man became calm, for the evil intruder had departed from him. The swine herds ran away to carry the tale of these events to people round about, who came to see for themselves what had happened. When they saw the man-man was rational, they became afraid and asked Jesus to go away. When Jesus was preparing to depart, the man who had been cured begged to go along with him. But Jesus said, No, you remain here and bear witness for me. The man spread the tale of what had been done for him through all the free cities, but he received much silver in the marketplaces. Coming close to another town on the seashore where a crowd was gathered to hear him, Jesus saw Matthew seated where dues were collected, and he said to him, Are you ready to follow me? For he had spoken with Matthew before. Matthew replied, I am ready, but first come and eat with me. When Jesus arrived at Matthew's house, he found other tax gatherers had assembled there, with many others who did not observe the laws of Moses, which are in the holy books of the Jews. While eating, Jesus said, No man of himself can know right from wrong. For what is right in one man's eyes may be wrong in another's. Therefore strife arises among them. Only when men accept a single standard of judgment and abide by it can there be peace. When men live together without the light of the law, they are like a house built with unmortared bricks, or like men trying to tow a boat, but all pulling in different directions. There are two laws, the laws of men and the law of the Father who is in heaven. When I speak of the law, I do not mean the law of man. I am the light illuminating God's law, so men see it more clearly. And though I fulfill the law, I do not change it. Never say this is right or that is wrong, but only that is right or wrong according to the law and in the light of Jesus. I bring new oil for the lamp of the law, for that within it is now impure, and the light produces too much obscuring smoke. For I am the Son of Man and bear the sufferings of men, coming to fulfill their hopes, even as, as it has been foretold. Is it not said among the Jesineth that the Son of Man is the perfected man, who will set the standard of those who wish to be the true sons of God? Later, when Jesus went outside, he found some perishim standing apart, as was their custom, and one put the question to Jesus, How can you claim to be a teacher interpreting the laws of God when you associate with the tax gatherers and lawbreakers? Jesus replied, It is not the healthy who need the attentions of a physician, but those who are ill. It is the tree growing out of the sand which requires watering, not the one growing by the river. I come to minister to the spiritually sick, not to the righteous who have their consolation. The man in the crowd said, This is a day of fasting, kept by all who are truly religious. Yet here are you and your disciples, eating and drinking. Jesus said, Is it usual for attendants of the bridal bower to deprive themselves of pleasure while the bridegroom is with them? Soon he will depart, and that is the time for hearts to be heavy. A heart weighed down without cause is an unnecessary burden, adding neither joy nor benefit to the lives of men. Fasting is good, but when it becomes a routine religious rite, it is no more than a purposeless vexation. A soldier in the crowd asked Jesus, Do you uphold the teachings of John of the wilderness? For there was a man I could understand. Jesus replied, John sent men to me inquiring whether I was the promised one, or should they look for another? I said, Go back and inform John of all things you have heard and seen here, and how the poor are learning about the coming of the rule of God, and the disinherited told when justice will reign. People went out into the wilderness, expecting to find a great man, but what had they in mind? A man speaking like the prophets of old, or a nobleman clad in garments of fine linen? John dressed in a manner fit for the place and purpose, and he spoke in accordance with the message he had to convey. He was the man of whom the holy books speak, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, preparing the path for the one who follows. I tell you with all sincerity, no mother ever gave birth to a better man than John. Yet when the rule of God comes, everyone living will have to exceed him. Ever since John declared these things, he was harried with violence, 
even though all the prophets before him foretold present events. He spoke with the voice of Elijah. If any of you have the understanding, you will know what I mean. Concerning this generation, which is wrapped up within itself and blind to all goings-on about it, there is little to say. It is like children at play calling out to one another. We play the pipes, but you refuse to dance. We raise a lament, but you will not mourn. Like all good men, John was misunderstood, for few knew the measure of greatness. He lived simply, neither eating nor drinking to excess, and because of his way of life, men called him crazy. The servant of man comes along and goes among the people, eating and drinking with them, and he is accused of gluttony, loose living, and drunkenness. What must a man do to prove himself in the eyes of the people? Whatever he does is wrong. One of the parishim who was nearby said to Jesus, We understand your meaning, but where do you stand in relation to the law? Have you come to take it away or declare it obsolete? Jesus replied, No one patches an old cloak with new fabric, for this shows up its age without strengthening it. Likewise, no sensible person puts new wine into old wineskins, for this causes them to split the wine pouring out, so neither the wine nor the wineskins have any value. Is it not much wiser to put new wine into new wineskins? I have come to place something besides that which is already there, to hold a mirror to the law and to man, so both may be seen with greater clarity. A poor man standing nearby said, What use is the wisdom of the holy books? Will it provide our bread? Jesus replied, What use is a lamp at night? Will its light appease hunger? Is it worthless because it cannot do so? Each thing has its appointed use. The foot should not be called upon to do the work of the arm, nor the ear the work of the eyes. A carpenter does not do the work of a potter, nor does a weaver make plows. A pupil may not be a good teacher, nor a servant a good master. Each must seek only to excel in the position he has, and not to be better than others at their own task. Whoever supports me, that person will I support, and I will strive with those who are against me. I have not come to bring peace, but to put a sword into the hands of men, setting sons against their fathers and daughters against their mothers. For nothing is worthy if a man will not fight for it. Anyone following me will find enemies among his own kindred, and though he love his parents above all else, I will give him a cause which is greater. My burden is not light and must be shouldered with fortitude and courage. Those finding it too heavy must go elsewhere. A man who seeks to prefer preserve his life through cowardice will be deprived of its benefits, and he who is prepared to make sacrifices for the cause of man will surely gain the crown of life. Whoever receives a good and just man openly, giving him his due, shall in turn be given the reward of his merit. But those who expect to receive rewards bestowed only by one greater than a prophet will be disappointed. It was after this that Jesus said to his disciples, When the task is difficult, a man seeks consolation from his father. A man may be lonely among many, but no one need be lonely in the spirit, for this is never shut off from communication with a source of comfort. Then Jesus prayed, Our Father above heaven and earth, your Son submits to your will, and if things declared in your name remain mysteries to the learned, but are revelations to the simple-hearted, you know best, my Father. You have placed a great responsibility on your Son, but few heed him. The Father's words spoken through the mouth of his Son are not highly regarded. Later, at another place, Jesus said to the people gathered there, Follow me, all those who are overburdened and weary, and I will help you. Take the yoke of my cause upon you, and learn from me, for this will ease and not add to your load. I am understanding and compassionate, not expecting anyone to bear a load too heavy for them. The heavy laden shall know the light and be moved from the darkness. But they who cast aside their burden and go astray are lost forever in darkness. Life loads each according to his capacity and no two bear a similar burden. At this time, Jesus always kept some disciples with him, and he walked about, and one Sabbath, he and two of them were following a small pathway, leading past uncut corn ripening in the husk. The disciples plucked a handful, for the law permitted them to do this, providing they did not enter the field or take any away, and rubbing the ears between their fingers, ate the grains. Three perishim were passing by, and they rebuked the disciples and said to Jesus, why do you allow your followers to do things not permitted on the Sabbath? Jesus answered, Does the deed affect the day? Have you not read that when driven by hunger, David went into the house of God and took the sanctified loaves to eat? 
sharing them with his men? Though these loaves were reserved for priestly fare, did he not justify himself by saying all produced by the earth were for the use of men? Surely the Sabbath was made for the sake of man, and not man for the sake of the Sabbath. As man bows to the needs of life, so the Sabbath must bow to the needs of men. Toward evening as they returned, Jesus saw a man working in the fields and said to him, If your labors are dedicated to the service of God, you are blessed. But if it is otherwise, you are a lawbreaker. The disciples hearing this said, Sire, is there so much difference between the things of the morning and the things of the evening? Jesus said, The same difference as between an empty stomach and a full one. The same thing may be forgiven one man, but not another. On another Sabbath, Jesus came out of the temple to be accosted by a man with a paralyzed arm, who said, Sire, I am a mason who can no longer be useful, and must humiliate myself by begging for fee food to feed my family. Let me become a whole man again, not for my sake, but for the sake of those depending on me. Nearby stood, stood some self-righteous members of the congregation, who watched closely to see what Jesus would do. But he, knowing their thoughts, called them over and said, Let me know your views concerning the keeping of the Sabbath. Should good be done when it would be uncharitable to leave it undone? They said, We abide by the law as it is interpreted for us by those knowing better than we. Jesus became angry and was hurt in his heart, for their hard-heartedness and wrongful interpretation of the law were indications of their spiritual apathy. So he healed the man's arm. The self-righteous see no wrong in themselves, only in others, and they interpret all things to accord with their own convenience. Then the self-righteous ones left, plotting amongst themselves, and they decided to become supporters of Herod, who was against Jesus. They said, Let us set a trap for this troublemaker who condemns our ways. He reproaches us, wrong he reproaches us for wrongdoing when we simply obey the law, and accuses us of things which he declares to be sinful, but which are not more than natural weaknesses of men. He proclaims himself to be the mouthpiece of God, so let us test him and see. Let us find out whether he speaks true or false. We will send men to beat him up and see then whether God comes to his aid. But other men abuse him and hurl insults at him, heaping every kind of indign indignity upon him, treating him roughly to test his gentleness. We will heckle him and cause commotion wherever he speaks and see whether he abides by his own teachings under provocation. They laid their plans. However, there were others who came to Jesus and asked him how they would recognize the Deliverer when he appeared among them. Jesus said, Is it not written, He will judge the disinherited and lonely who trust in him? He will smite the earth with the rod of his tongue and destroy wickedness. He will be girded with integrity and belted with trustworthiness. Some said, Surely this man is God's anointed. Someone said, Sire, how do we know the Deliverer will come to us? Jesus said, Jesus said, Is it not written, He will come to the worthy and just? But to the people He will be like a winnowing fan, ensuring only the best are gathered in. It is also said, He will bless those who follow Him with wisdom and gladness. He will be sinless, gathering together a dedicated people whom He will lead in righteousness as an example to all nations. They will cast out the ungodly from their midst. Those born in the days of the Deliverer will witness the things He will do for the generations which follow. Is it not also written, the words of his mouth will smite the earth forever, and for the chosen among men, there will be a guiding light for the rest of their days.